So good to have you here. And happy Sabbath once again. My family and I are just so thankful that we can come to the end of this year. And uh, we've had a very eventful year and uh, just many reasons to be grateful to the Lord for. He's been with us. He has blessed us with so many gifts. I guess the biggest gift he gave us this year was Caleb. He was born on May 16th. And uh, we're just grateful to be here with the Miles City Church. Um, this will be our first Christmas and New Year here in Miles City of several to come, we believe. And we're just grateful that the Lord has given us this opportunity. And I hope that you have had a blessed year and just be thinking throughout the week of all the good that God has done. We have so much to be thankful for. We can focus on the negative, but there's just so much to be thankful for. And today we're going to talk about Jesus and why Christmas, why Jesus died. That's the title of the message, but I'd like to talk about Christmas for just a moment because Christmas has always been a holiday that has generated controversy throughout history. In recent times here in the United States, arguments have surfaced in the U.S. over Christmas. Some believe it is more appropriate to say Happy Holidays instead of Merry Christmas. The president-elect, Donald Trump, during his campaign rallies was known to say, I am a good Christian. If I become president, we're going to be saying Merry Christmas at every store. You can leave Happy Holidays at the corner. So even in our day and age, in our society, Christmas has generated a little bit of controversy. And I want to just share with you a little bit of history, a few facts about Christmas um, and the controversies that have been generated over time. In 350, Pope Julius I, Bishop of Rome, proclaimed December 25 the official celebration date for the birthday of Christ without any evidence to support the claim that Jesus was born on that day. And I don't know if you know, but even here in the United States throughout our history, Christmas has been somewhat controversial. From 1659 to 1681, it was illegal to celebrate Christmas in Boston. Those who were caught celebrating were fined. Alabama was the first state in the United States to officially recognize Christmas in 1836. Christmas wasn't declared an official holiday in the United States until June 26, 1870. And President Teddy Roosevelt was an environmentalist, and he banned Christmas trees from the White House in 1901. A tree in the White House did not become an established practice until the 1920s. Oklahoma was the first United States state to declare Christmas a legal holiday in, I'm sorry, the last, in 1907. Alabama was the first in 1836. Approximately 30 to 35 million real Christmas trees are sold each year today in the United States. Each year, more than 3 billion Christmas cards are sent in the United States. Silent Night, which we sang, I believe, during Sabbath school, is the most recorded Christmas song in history, with over 733 different versions copyrighted since 1978. Just some facts about Christmas. You know, tomorrow is Christmas. I believe we're going to have a white Christmas here in Miles City from what I'm hearing. Hopefully it'll start tomorrow, not today, because I'll be driving to Harden after church. But Christmas has been a controversial Are thinking about Christmas, but Christmas is supposed to be about Jesus. The word comes from two words, Christ, which is a transliteration of the Greek word Christos, meaning the anointed one, and mass, 
So it's Christ Mass. Mass meaning festival. So Christmas is supposed to be a celebration of Jesus, a celebration of his birth, life, death, resurrection, high priestly ministry, at least for Adventists, and his soon return. So nothing wrong with talking about it, celebrating it any time of the year, and if the rest of the world does it on December 25, why not us? And so let's talk about the story of Jesus, how he was born in the little town of Bethlehem, how his earthly parents couldn't find a room on the night that he was born and how he was born in a stable. How many people understand that he was born in a manger with animals because there was no room in Bethlehem? How many people understand how Jesus was raised in Nazareth by his mother Mary and his earthly father Joseph in the city of Nazareth in the province of Galilee? At the age of 30, he began his public ministry. How many people are talking about Jesus' teachings, Jesus' ministry of going around healing the sick with supernatural power? and relieving the sufferings of humanity. How Jesus loved the children. How Jesus was merciful and loving towards the outcasts of society, while at the same time never condoning sin. How Jesus was patient and respectful towards those who were ashamed of him. I think of Nicodemus, who was afraid, ashamed, embarrassed to go and visit Jesus during the day because of his status in society and because Jesus wasn't very popular. And of course, what Jesus accomplished for the salvation of the world on the cross. That's what we're going to focus on today. Jesus' death. There are many things that we can say about Jesus' death, what it accomplished, there are many things it accomplished. Jesus died for several reasons. Number one, to show us what God is like. To, sh to change our attitude towards God. To provide a legal basis for pardoning our sins. When we talk about Jesus died to forgive us, what does that mean? to expose the adversary, to show not only what God is like, but what is the enemy of God like. All of this was revealed on the cross. And of course, Jesus, by dying on the cross, revealed the perpetuity of God's law. If it wasn't for the eternal nature of God's law, Jesus would not have needed to die in order for humanity to have a chance to be saved through forgiveness. But what I want to focus on today is that Jesus died to change our attitude towards God. Jesus died to change how we feel about God, how we perceive God. Many people believe that Jesus died in order to change how God feels about humanity. You have a picture of God in the Old Testament that has led many people to believe that God is a tyrant, an exacting, a strict, and unforgiving God, and that Jesus needed to die in order to change how he feels about us. But what I would like to suggest to you today in our study is that Jesus came, he lived, and he died in order to change how we feel about God. So let's study. Why did he have to die? Was it to change how God feels about us? Or was it to change how we feel about God? 
And I believe that one of the most known verses in the Bible should answer that question for us. John chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In other words, because God loved the world so much, he gave. That's what the verse is saying. His son, Jesus, did not have to die in order to make the world lovable to God. God loved the world, and because he loved the world, he gave. That's what this verse is saying. What did the sacrifice of Jesus accomplish? Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. And how did he show this love? By giving his son. So we love him because he first sent his son. Our love for God is in response to something. What is it? His love. And how was his love revealed? For God so loved the world that he gave. So, we love him because Jesus died. Does that make sense? In other words, we don't love him and because we love him, God loves us. It's the other way around. God loves us. And because he loves us and takes the initiative, that changes our attitude towards him. So why did all of this have to happen? Why couldn't God just create people that would love him automatically? Or those that rebelled against him, why doesn't he just force them to love him? Let me illustrate. Let's imagine two brothers getting into a fight. We'll call the little one Mike and the older one John. And Mike punches John in the eye. Mom intervenes and asks questions, and she determines that Mike is to blame. Tell your brother you're sorry, Mom tells Mike. Mike not only doesn't feel sorry, but if he could punch my, John in the other eye, he would do it. Regardless of how Mike feels, Mom is stronger than both Mike and John, and she asserts her authority and demands that Mike apologizes. What does Mike do? He says, I'm sorry, with an angry face. And he's got that look in his eye. What kind of I'm sorry is that? Well, I'm not sure John is convinced but mom is not satisfied. Tell your brother that you love him. So Mike, still upset, tells John, I love you. That's not enough. Mom tells Mike, kiss your brother. Now that's going too far. But again, she asserts her authority threatens him and tells him what the consequences will be if he doesn't obey. So Mike turns and says, I can't. Mom says, do it. Mike, evaluating the consequences, kisses his older brother John. Imagine the quality of that kiss. Does that change anything in John's heart towards Mike? You understand why God needed to do something that would not only arbitrarily change how people feel about him, but would create a response of voluntary 
love and obedience to him? Love cannot be forced. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Romans chapter 5 verse 9. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How does God demonstrate his love? By giving. Does he give towards those that deserve something? Does he wait for some recognition that the other party is wrong before he takes the initiative to go out and try to bring about reconciliation? I want to read a beautiful quote from Steps to Christ, page 13. This great sacrifice, talking about Jesus, was not made in order to create in the Father's heart a love for man, not to make him willing to save. No, no. The Father loves us not because of the great propitiation, but he provided the propitiation because he loves us. Christ's sacrifice is designed to awaken in us a love for God. How do people feel naturally in this context of sin about God? How do we feel about God? Maybe we are afraid of him. Maybe we have guilt. Maybe we don't like him because we think he's arbitrary or too imposing on our freedom. Can't do this, can't do that. He has a moral standard. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8, the Bible says, they, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of of the Lord. That's how we feel towards God. We're afraid of him. We misunderstand him. Genesis 3:10. So he said, Adam speaking, I heard your voice, God's voice in the garden, and I was afraid. So what role does Jesus' death play in our salvation? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So why do we need a mediator? You know what a mediator is, right? You have two parties that are in conflict, that are at odds, and a mediator serves as a unifying agent to bring together two parties that have been alienated. So how does that work? Are we angry at God or is God angry at us or both? Do we have a problem with God as human beings by nature? We're like Adam and Eve. We're afraid, we're guilty, and by nature, we want to avoid having someone over us that will be Lord of our lives. That's just how we are. And is God angry? Yeah, God is angry, but what is God angry at? The Bible talks a lot about the wrath of God. What is the wrath of God? Well, the Bible says, let's turn in our Bibles. Let's just once today at least. Look at a verse together, Romans chapter 1. It's a great verse to explain the wrath of God. There's much in the Bible about the wrath of God. And yes, God is angry. God's anger is not a human emotion. It's not an anger like we're angry. The word anger or wrath is really the best word that biblical writers could come up with to express how God feels towards something. You know, after the flood, or before the flood, you know, Moses says that God repented that he had created man. Well, does God repent? He's an omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful God. Does God repent? 
Well, that's just a way of expressing how sorry God felt that things went the way they did. Well, anger, God's wrath, God's anger. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. What is God angry at? The Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Notice the clear distinction between the unrighteousness or sin of men or people and the people themselves. God is angry at sin. God is angry at sin because sin is destructive. Sin is damaging. Sin causes pain and suffering. God is angry, but he's not angry at people. People are angry at God. Jesus as mediator is not trying to cool off the wrath of God so that he can bring himself to love unlovable people. No. The Bible says in John 3.16 that God so loved that he gave. God loved and he gave. He didn't give his son so that he could love. He loved and he gave. So Jesus is mediator between God and man, not to change how God feels about people, but to change how people feel about God. Do you remember on Mount Sinai how the people felt about approaching God? Do you remember that? They were afraid. They needed a mediator. They told Moses, Moses, you go before God on our behalf. See, we need a mediator between us and God, not because God can't tolerate our presence, but because we cannot tolerate the presence of God. If God were to take us to heaven the way we are and force us to live eternally with him without a sincere and genuine change of heart and attitude, we would be miserable throughout eternity. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. God was in Christ reconciling, that's the mediator role, the world to himself. You see the nuance here in this verse? God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And some can interpret that to mean that without Christ, God could never love the world. But that contradicts John 3.16. You see, God so loved the world that through Christ, he's trying to help people feel differently towards him. He's trying to break down the barriers and to destroy the sin that separates, that creates a gap between God and man. Why is reconciliation necessary? Colossians chapter 1 verse 21, and you who were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. So notice that it, the problem is not in God's mind. It's not how God feels. The problem is how we feel in our minds. Do you see the verse here? where it's saying that you were alienated. The problem is with us. The death of Jesus changes us, not God. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will do what? Draw all people to myself. See, Jesus' death is designed to draw people to God. The idea that God would make a sacrifice, even though he is the innocent party, we're the guilty party, but he's the one that takes the initiative, he pays the price, he does what's necessary for reconciliation, that is different than what we're used to seeing in this world, isn't it? Let me give you an example. If I mess up and I make a mistake 
and I am offensive towards my wife, and she's the hurt party, and I'm the guilty party, what's the expectation? The one that is guilty, take the initiative and say you're sorry, right? If you're the innocent party in any conflict, you feel like you have the right to wait in your corner until the person that's done wrong comes to you and recognizes all the harm that they that's the way we do things in this world, right? Well, the gospel, the Christ, I'm right, they're wrong, but I'm going to take the initiative. I'm going to go to them. He not only goes, but he pays a costly price and risks everything, even the possibility of his goodwill and his love and his sacrifice to be despised and rejected. Now, I've met people that have been the innocent party and they've actually been willing to take some initial steps. But then they say, if they don't respond, then I'm withdrawing my forgiveness. In other words, if they don't change and they don't do what they're supposed to do, then... See, God took risks. He makes the initiative. He makes the sacrifice. He suffers abuse. That's what the gospel story is about. Jesus, if I be lifted up, he said, I will draw all men to me. See, people are touched by the sacrifice. And the Holy Spirit works a change, a genuine change in the heart. The Bible teaches that Jesus was the clearest revelation of an invisible God that could ever be given to man. God has been grossly misrepresented and misunderstood. Jesus claimed that those who have seen him have seen God. Millions have been blessed, transformed, because they have become familiar with a loving, just, merciful, logical God through the person of Jesus. Unfortunately, most people during this Christmas season are not thinking about Jesus, what Christmas is supposed to be about. But let's take some time to think about it. And may it not just be a theory, an abstract idea somewhere out there, but may it change how we relate to each other. May it transform our characters. May it it make us more like God, loving, merciful, gracious, forgiving. At this time, we're going to hear another music.